We are so thrilled to be partnering with Hinge. Hinge is the dating app designed to be deleted. As you all know, I'm a huge Hinge advocate as I met my partner of almost three years on the app. Even before meeting him, Hinge was always my go-to app because I met more relationship-minded people here and had some great dates. Clearly, I haven't been on the app for a little while, but I re-downloaded it to check out some of the new features. One that stood out to me was the voice prompt, my best friend's take on why you should date me, where your friend can hype you up. Not only does this make the profile creation less daunting, but it's not always easy to see your own green flags. So to test it out, I asked UA some fun prompts to get her take on what I could put if I was dating again. So the first one, how long have we known each other? What was your first impression of me and how has that changed? Julie and I have known each other for almost 10 years. My first impression of Julie was that she's very social, but I've learned that she has a lot more depth to her beyond the social butterfly that she is. My next prompt, what do you think are my green flags? I would say she's deeply loyal. She believes in love, curious mindset, and she is fearlessly ambitious. And then last but not least, what kind of friend am I? Julie is the kind of friend who will always have your back, no matter what. Damn, that feels nice to hear. So download Hinge and try voice prompts today. Then find some one worth deleting the app for. Hi, I'm Yui Shu. And I'm Julie Kraftchik. We're active daters turned dating sociologists. Here to dive into everything modern dating and relationships. Welcome to the Dateable Podcast. Hello, friends. Howdy. Cheerio. <laughs> there are different ways to say hello. <laughs> Ni hao. <laughs> like, we'll just say it. Bringing it to all the cultures listening to Dateable right now. Love it. We are a global show. We are. We talk about global dating. You know, people are dating all around the world. It's the universal language of love. Don't you love when we get a message from someone? I feel like, what did we get? We got one recently Portugal. about exit interview. Yes. And it just, it warms my heart, you know, to know that we're having impact everywhere. But it also more than anything shows that we're all in it together and we're all experienced the same shit, no matter where we are. Isn't that comforting to know <laughs> that when you get ghosted in Des Moines, Iowa, there's someone else. <laughs> in Portugal, <laughs> having the same thing In Portugal, to them. <laughs> who's, experience, who's experiencing the same thing, just in a different language. Comforting or sad, I'm not sure, but <laughs> we'll go with comforting. Comforting. We'll go with comforting. <laughs> well, this episode is comforting. I oh, think this episode yeah, will be is. comforting for many people. This listener reached out to us mm -hmm. telling us that he was part of the incel group. And the more we spoke to him, the more we realized I would not consider him part of incel. And we want to set him free from that <laughs> identity. And it's really about how your past and how you look at your past identity that's holding you back. And I would even go as far as to say how your past is robbing you of your future potential. Absolutely. And just to more context, we got this in response to a very popular episode last season, The Rise of Lonely Single Men that we did with Dr. Mm -hmm. Greg Machos. And he got a ton of backlash from this. I don't know why this came up recently, but I was searching for his article again. And mm -hmm. I saw a New York Post article that was basically like, therapist slammed for you know yeah saying all this nasty shit and it's like he didn't do that he just said he what was not. happening but that's says the point but i think you know a lot of people can relate to this and this really resonated with our guest ben today and like you said ua he identified is involuntarily celibate like he had no control in the matter. But as we dug in, that really was not the case. I feel like this is such a universal topic. All have that one thing that we think is getting in the way of our love lives. And a lot mm -hmm. of that is r rooted deep, rooted from our childhoods, rooted from just the way that we interacted in a dating context as, you know, in our teens and growing up and how prevalent dating was for us versus it wasn't. We sometimes get stuck that we're either like this relationship person, a serial monogamous, or we're incapable of having a relationship. But when we actually look mm -hmm. at the evidence, 
It's just stories that we've told ourselves because of things that might have happened years ago. And I was just home recently. I was back, unfortunately, for a funeral of my grandmother. She lived a long life to 95. It was really nice ceremony because like the last couple years she's had Alzheimer's and to be honest I think she's in a better place now than Mm -hmm. when she was alive so it's like sad but also you know how sometimes that can be it's sometimes for the best and it did remind me you know her funeral we they really focused it on the early part of her life because the rabbi Jewish ceremony said that like she would want to be remembered for the life she had not the last couple Mm. years that weren't you know it brought back a lot for me being there because we talked about early childhood memories and just how we experienced love as a family and like family values that were instilled and I think a lot of it was actually really positive sometimes we think about like the past and we're like what is that whole what can we like point to an attachment theory that explains why we date the way we do and we're fucked up about love but I think it's also important to think about like what values were instilled in you as a child child about love and Mm. family. But it also brought up things like, you know, I thought about limiting beliefs I had growing up about like, you know, I was put on like a lot of diets growing up and just like this feeling Mm. of like, you have to look a certain way to attract someone. And it's hard to unravel that stuff. Like we have that stuff imprinted in us for a really long time. So I can totally relate to Ben of yes, what happened to you years ago might not seem relevant because it was so long ago, but it's hard because there's a piece of you that still hold it on to it. Yeah. And you all will see and hear in this episode, Ben did go through something traumatic in his life, which he is now moving away from, but it's also holding him back. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I had a conversation with my good friend, Emily, and we were talking about this idea of grief, but not grieving people who've died, but grieving a part of you that no longer exists. And I truly believe that why change is so hard for many people, all of us, is because we are still holding on to an identity from yesterday. Mm -hmm. And we can't look past and think about what could my identity be tomorrow. So we don't grieve the past us which makes it hard for us to move on. And part of that is like, why don't we, you know, like I think about getting out of relationships. When you are going through a breakup, you're still in the identity of uh, being a partner to someone. Mm -hmm. So it's hard, right? You're not grieving that part yet. And then you're thinking like, I need to go out more. I need to get drunk. I need to do all the things to help me avoid thinking about this part. When we can really spend the time to, to just say goodbye. And it's sad. It's emotional. That's okay. We need to spend the time to say goodbye to the parts of us that no longer exist in us. And that is okay. Our identities are constantly changing. And this is why this conversation is so important because Ben came to us having this identity in mind that he is incel. <laughs> yeah. And from an outsider's perspective, we already saw him two steps ahead of this <laughs> incel identity. So your potential is so much more than what you think you are today. Absolutely. I think that's such a good point about like grieving the past self. You know, it makes perfect sense when you're exiting a relationship. But I think a lot of us also struggle with, you know, when we've been single for so long, moving oh, into yeah. a relationship. It's like, well, I'm the single person or I've done life this way because it's just been me for so long. And it's not that that life in that stage wasn't valid, but it's hard to move forward, especially if your part is saying, I really want to move to this next stage, but you're still Mm -hmm. identifying in this past phase. It's a lot to rectify sometimes and change is hard. You know, change can be challenging and viewing yourself in a different lens is hard, but we also have to remember, like, how do we choose our hard like in Ben's Mm -hmm. case like is just saying you're an incel that's freaking hard too like how do we use the hard to get to where we actually want to be Exactly. So for anybody listening, that's kind of your homework going (laughs) into this episode before we play the interview. Think about what is a part of you that you can very politely say (laughs) goodbye to 
And what is a part of you that you want to embrace more of? And when you come in with that mindset, this conversation will make a lot more sense for you. I think that's enough for for talking about the episode because people will get to hear the interview. Yes, absolutely. So announcements this week. At Dateable Podcast is our Instagram. Make sure to leave us that rating and review. We've said it before. We're getting closer to that 1K. I'm really excited every time I look and we're inching (laughs) closer and closer. The reviews have been amazing. We've put out the call for reviews in Brunch Talk too lately. UA, do you think we should read a couple reviews like recently? I'm pulling it up. Gets inspired, but I love seeing the ones that are like, "This, this podcast helps me so much. This is what truly keeps us going is knowing that we're helping all of you. We started this conversation at the top that we're all going through the same shit no matter our location. So this is what helps us. Tell us where you live. That also helps. It makes it real of the, you know, the people that we're actually impacting with this podcast. I'm going to read two two reviews okay. we got recently. One is from Jag. <laughs> love this podcast and love the Brunch Talk episodes. Feels like I'm chatting with friends. I love hearing about other girls' experiences that are similar to mine. Thank you so much, Jag. This one's from a listener from SF here, maybe. <laughs> you guys are amazing. I love listening to every new episode. Hope to bump into you in person one day. Yeah, it's yes. possible. People have bumped into us They have. Before. I was getting a coffee one day and one really sweet listener was like, are you Julie from Dateable? <laughs> <laughs> she just moved here from Toronto. So hello, if you're still listening. But this, it was so great. She was telling me she had listened to every episode we ever put out. And it was so Shit. surreal meeting someone, especially when I was disheveled on my phone, not expecting to meet someone. But those are the best encounters. Always. <laughs> That's wild. That's so wild. Those are the best stories. So yes, if you do see us out in the wild, please approach. We love it. We love it. it. We, love it. we love it. I feel like we there's this one event at SF Crab Feed, the Crab Feed every year mm-hmm. that we no fail will run into someone every single year. Remember yeah. we had that really yeah. sweet girl that came over to us and she pulled her boyfriend and told us that she had listened to episodes in the park before meeting him. Yes. And it totally changed her perspective of who she wanted, how she wanted to date. And then she had this amazing boyfriend. I hope they're still listening and they're doing well because she got him to listen also. <laughs> it was many years ago. It was. But yes. I hope she's doing well. <laughs> we love all those encounter stories, but we also love to encounter you virtually. Yes, you can yes. encounter us, you know through ratings and reviews, but also have you heard about our new show, Exit Interview, in conjunction with iHeart Podcast. It's a limited series where we interview people's exes, former flames, the one that got away. We are into the middle of the season now, so you can start binging if you haven't yet from episode one. They've been so phenomenal because they're so different. These daters couldn't be any more different from each other. And we guarantee you'll learn a little something from each. So you can just search for Exit Interview on any of those podcasting platforms and then follow us also on Instagram at Exit Interview Show. Yeah, this is the perfect time to catch up if you haven't yet because we're actually about to release a check-in next week. So Thursday, this comes out Tuesday. If you're listening real time, if you're not, then it's already out, even better. But this check-in is gonna see how all these daters took the feedback, see what's changed in their dating lives. Listening to episodes one through five, binge listen. We've heard so many dateable listeners say, I actually like listen to this one a little different than dateable. Like dateable, I stay on top of every week. But this one, I'm just doing them all at once because it's like you're watching Love is Blind or, you know, one of the dating shows. It's to that caliber of oh my God, this shit cannot be real. Yet it is. <laughs> <laughs> we witnessed them all. We we're just super it. proud of this project. So thank you for supporting us. Thank you to all of you who've already submitted yes. your feedback and ratings and reviews. You no, know, this especially helps Exit Interview right now because it's a new podcast and we're trying to really, you know, you know, we're, we live in a world where everyone... <laughs> judges, right? If something's worth listening to because of reviews, that's the world we live in. You are really helping us out if you leave a review at this stage. Yes! Yeah, season two. Season two. <laughs> Love it. it. That is our last call out. I know we've beat the dead horse, but it is so important. So thank you in advance. Okay, well, before we get into it, let's hear a message from our sponsors. 
This episode is sponsored by Vaya. We all know there are things that can help set the mood in the bedroom, but did you know a little THC could also do that? Yes, Vaya has developed a unique blend of pleasure-enhancing cannabinoids, libido-strengthening herbs, and a low dose of THC all into one mind-blowing gummy called High Love. This gummy, wow, it will awaken your senses, increase blood flow, and intensify any sexual experience. I've been pleasantly surprised by the High Love gummies because it is just the right amount of THC. THC for me to have a good time without feeling sleepy. And hey, if THC is not your thing, Vaya also offers a wide array of other gummies without it. And everything legally ships in 50 states with discreet packaging directly to your door. So if you're over 21, you can get 15% off and a free pack of award-winning Dreams THC plus CBN sleep gummies with our exclusive code DATEABLE at ViaHemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. Let the gummies work their magic. Head to to viahemp.com and use a code DATEABLE to receive 15% off and one free sample of their sleepy dream gummies. That's viahemp.com and use a code D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E at checkout. Take your passion and pleasure to a whole new level with high love from Via Hemp. Living with ADHD can be a challenge and dating with ADHD is definitely a challenge, we've heard many of you say, but finding the right care and proper tools needed to succeed can be life-changing. Done is an online ADHD care platform that can get you all the resources you need to help manage your ADHD. Online visits, refills, and a 24-7 care team made for you. In just one minute, Done's online assessment can help kickstart your ADHD treatment journey. With experienced clinicians, worry fill refills, and online visits, you can start getting personalized care as soon as today or tomorrow. So contact an expert team that can help you around the clock and get a personalized treatment plan just for you. Here's how you do it. Take a free one-minute assessment and book an appointment with a licensed ADHD clinician as soon as the next day. Get continuous care, one-click refills, insurance coverage, and 24-7 care team support with Done for just $79 a month. And pharmacy co-pays as low as $0. Visit get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. That's get.donefirst.com slash podcast to learn more. Done. Turn ADHD into your strength. Okay, let's hear it from Ben. We absolutely love hearing about how our listeners are dating. This is one of our favorite things. As much as we love experts (laughs) and science and data, there's nothing better than actual data, which is your personal stories. And today we have a personal story told by one of our listeners, Ben. Welcome to our show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. And you wrote in in response to an episode we did called The Rise of Single Lonely Men with Dr. Matos. You have a lot to say about that episode, so we'll get into that. But who is Ben? That's what we want to know. He is 28 years old, lives in Pleasant Hill, California, originally from Richmond and single and actively going on dates. So this is what you wrote in. A 28-year-old incel who is actively dating, but starting to worry whether something is wrong with me. I heard your episode with Dr. Matos and wanted to tell my dating story in case another lonely man is looking for solace in a similar way. Tell us about your experience dating. Well, unfortunately, I uh, encapsulate a lonely single man and I've been actively dating for a while, but haven't really found any success, to be honest, doing the dating apps mainly. I've recently got off the dating apps because of my lack of success. I've been dating for a while without any results. What do you think your biggest challenge is on the apps? Finding that genuine connection. I get a lot of first dates. Okay. And yeah, I'm pretty easy to communicate with and never really have a problem with getting dates, but it's finding something more lasting that goes beyond the first date. I mean, maybe I get two or three, but it always fizzles out. Mm. And I'm just kind of left wondering why. I don't know. I'm curious when you heard that episode we did with Dr. Matos, because he does give some sort of solution or a way out. What were your thoughts when you heard some of his tips and advice? 
I think listening to his episode just made me realize that it's a trend in modern dating and that I'm not alone because sometimes I, I do feel very alone mm -hmm. just because my friends that I surround myself with don't really have this problem. And when I bring it up, their friends and acquaintances, they're always like, wow, I can't believe that. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes me feel like I don't know what the answer is here. So I think just listening to his episode gave me a little sense of relief in that I was kind of able to just realize that, yeah, I'm not alone in this. So we talk about dating and getting past the first date, which honestly, we do hear a lot from both men and women, not just mm -hmm. single lonely men. You know, I think there's something widespread in today's dating culture that it is hard to meet that meaningful connection. Like, why do you think you're kind of feeling like, I feel like you use the word, I want to quote you exactly, you use the word that you're feeling like something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, why do you think you're feeling that way? Like, what's been the rest of your relationship history, sexual history? Does it go beyond just dating? It's been a clean, cold slate all across the board. Romantic relationships, sexual relationships. I used to play baseball and I kind of think about it like, man, if I couldn't throw a strike or I couldn't get a hit, I feel like there would be something wrong with me and my, my skills. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes me think in the dating sphere or the romantic sphere that, oh, Maybe there's something wrong with me, but I can't really pinpoint what that would be. Mm. So you're comparing your batting average to dates, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which that is kind terrible. of terrible. That sounds terrible. It, well, yes. I mean, it sounds it could sound terrible, but I understand it from where <laughs> you're coming from. We also live in a very achievement focused yeah. society where dating seems like it needs to be an achievement. But as you've heard on our show, you said you've been listening to Dateable for a year. We're very much focused focus on the quality and what you're learning from the people you're meeting. And it doesn't have to be everybody is going to get past a first date. Like we always say, not everyone's going to be your cup of tea, <laughs> but there is a lid for every pot. So our two favorite sayings ever. <laughs> but you do describe yourself as incel. What does that mean? What does that definition mean to you? Well, I've been actively dating for a while now with the goal of finding a connection, whether that be sexual or a lasting romantic connection. Ultimately, I'm looking for a lasting romantic connection with someone. I unfortunately have been trying, but just have been, I guess, failing at that. So the term incel means involuntary celibate, and mm -hmm. I guess that's what I would be. And I also use that term just because I feel like People maybe associate that term with a bad person these days. Mm -hmm. So I want to dig into that more because I do think there is this connotation that a lot of incels are men that blame women for their lack of success yes. with dating. Mm -hmm. How do you think you're different or not from that stereotype? Yes, I tend to look internally to my problems. So I tend to kind of ask myself, instead of what's wrong with other people, I'll ask myself what's wrong with me. And through this process, you know, I've gone through every nook and cranny just trying to figure out, just trying to like patch all my holes and figure out, okay, what can I do here to be more successful? So I guess I just kind of want to get that across that some of us tend to look more internally than externally and not blame others for what we're going through. Mm -hmm. I guess the reason I ask is like, why even attach yourself to that label yes. in the first place? Like, why not just say, hey, you know, dating hasn't worked out for me. It's gonna work out in the future. Like, why even go there to be part of this community? Does it help in any way? Yeah, that's a good point. That is a very good point. I guess, honestly, maybe it's a little bit of like attention seeking mm. that I want to associate myself with that term and just display that not everyone who describes themselves as that is a bad person. And hopefully that label will change. I feel like when you just say involuntary celibate, that could apply to so many people. I mean, I was in a two year relationship when I was in cell for right. a year, you know, but if we're looking at the definition in terms of what it means as a slang term in this society, it's the hostility towards women. It's the involuntary celibacy due to hostility from women. Mm -hmm. So I am also very curious why you would want to attach yourself to this group when what you're really describing is what so many daters are going through, men and women. Now that you kind of illustrate it like that, I don't really know. But. <laughs> <laughs> 
I just think it might be holding you back a little, right? Like, Yeah, maybe I kind of put myself in a box there. Yeah, like involuntary celibacy. It makes it feel like there's like this disorder. There's this issue that like can't you can't get out from. Sometimes I do feel like, oh, maybe I have some sort of like disorder when it comes to social interactions. I mean, Mm. I don't feel like I do, but I'm kind of left wondering after all this time. I mean, I'm 28 now and I've been dating pretty actively since high school and it just seems like, man, to have no success, it's kind of worrying. Well, first of all, 28 is pretty young. Like, I feel like we hear a lot of people more. I think there's this feeling in society that you're supposed to have all these relationships. And it's something that people start racking up their relationships when they're 16 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we've learned that that actually isn't the case for many people, especially people that have focused on other aspects of life, like getting education, their careers, moving to different cities, like other aspects of building a fulfilling life. Sometimes relationships do go by the wayside. And I think also, at least from my personal experience too, the more years that build up, sometimes you can get lack of confidence in that regard. So it kind of compiles on itself when it hasn't happened on the timelines you necessarily thought. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to go back in time for you a little. Like, when you say that you were trying to date in high school, what did that even (laughs) look like? I think Tinder was very young when I graduated high school, the app itself. Wow. (laughs) I graduated in 2013, and I think it started maybe a few years before that. I feel real old right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Tinder yeah, I, was definitely not there in high school for you and I <laughs> maybe a good thing ultimately I don't know <laughs> I can't imagine using Tinder in high school no yeah senior year I think that's when I downloaded it and it was like just a whirlwind it was something so new to me because I had Facebook in high school, but I have never been a social media person. I've never had an Instagram or a Twitter or a Snapchat. And just talking to random people that you don't even really know and swiping all day, I mean, it got very addictive. And that was kind of the start of my dating experience. I was definitely very reserved in high school. Mm -hmm. I was a little overweight, and that definitely Mm -hmm. contributed to my shyness or reservedness. I dealt with some health issues in high school, and that was part of it. I had to be homeschooled at a time too. I was really just figuring myself out there. And I felt like I started kind of late (laughs) in the game because most of my friends were having romantic experiences way younger than that. But I was still trying to like, just figure out myself. It's hard to really understand the whole picture when you're so in it right now. And I really think in 10 years, you're going to look back and say, I had to go through that. Just like how you're thinking about your time dating in high school, how you became less reserved from your experience with Tinder. I think you're going to see the benefits of what you're going through in this season of your life. But I do wonder, though, if you know, dating oftentimes we talk about as a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when you call yourself an incel, when you yeah. put yourself in a group of people who are unsuccessful dating and can't get past first dates, then that's all you're focused on. And that's what's going to happen for you. Have you tried other ways of changing your perspective on dating? I think recently, yeah, I've done a lot better of a job through this process of not being as successful as I've wanted to be. In a weird way, I've gotten more confident in myself because I've kind of patched some holes that I thought were there. I've kind of expanded my horizons in certain ways because I have a lot of free time and a lot of time to work on hobbies and stuff like that. Recently, I started to go to a therapist right. and yes. talk to a therapist about this, mainly this issue. And I think it's been really rewarding in terms of my confidence and just kind of feeling comfortable in my own skin. So in a way, yeah, I totally resonate with what you're saying that I think in a few years, I'm already kind of realizing that this hardship, I think it's, or I thought it was a hardship, but it's really turning into maybe something that is helping me grow Mm -hmm. a lot more than I would have if I was having success in the dating realm. I hope this doesn't come off weird, but I feel like you're like a good looking guy. Like there shouldn't, you know, it's like there's, right? It's not like we're looking at you. There's something like fundamentally wrong, right? I think you're just holding on to the past in an image of yourself that doesn't actually exist today. I'm curious about, you said 
you don't have much experience sexually either. And I'm not saying that like, I think it's like commendable that you're looking for a relationship over sex. But I do want to unpack that a little more. Like, is that something you've tried? Like, are you a virgin? Like, have you had sex? Like, what's kissed a girl? Like, what's the background? total virgin, but I have kissed a girl before. Mm. And it's kind of a funny story. At 20 years old, I was diagnosed with cancer. Mm. I had testicular cancer. And I had kind of a situationship at the time that maybe even developed from this particular person, maybe kind of feeling a little bit bad for me. And that's when I got my first kiss at 20. But I think maybe I would have lost my virginity at the time had my groin area not been in a literal cast. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So, you Yeah, I guess maybe you could put a virgin with an asterisk on it. (laughs) Do you know that she kissed you because she felt bad for you? Or is that something that you've made up in your head? I mean, I don't know for sure. But events after that kind of made me think, hmm, it made me think twice about it. Mm. Very nice person, very nice woman. We reconnected, I think maybe two years later. And I asked her out on a date. And she said yes, because she didn't have the heart to tell me that she had a boyfriend at the time. So as we're going on the date, she tells me that she's not interested in anything romantic and she has a boyfriend. And it honestly made me like break down in the restaurant and have a little crying fest. But that's kind of where it starts from. You've been through a lot and dating doesn't have to look the way you think it needs to look like for other people. Because life hasn't looked the way it looks for other people for you. You're carving your own path. And we hope that we can kind of work through some of that in this episode is carving your own path of what healthy dating could look like. And maybe it is a slew of first dates. Maybe that is healthy dating at this point, right? Yeah. I'm glad you're open to that. Let's get into that. Yeah, I kind of approached the whole life experience with a laugh just because I learned so much through having cancer. And I was lucky enough to not, I was successful battling it and didn't have too many repercussions. I mean, there's always a chance that it could come back, but I don't think about that too often. And I learned so much through the experience. But of course you weren't dating when you were battling cancer. Yeah. Right? (laughs) Like, I think like one of the things I remember going to therapy and talking to my therapist thinking like, it was after a breakup, just being like, I'm not the type of person that's in long term relationships. And she was like, look at your life. And how many times have you not actually been in the place to even try to be in a long term relationship? You have this narrative that's not actually backed up by data at all. It's just this feeling of like, why me? Why can't I make something work? But it doesn't actually mean that you've been trying and failing all this time. Like, I guarantee clearly we weren't there, but I'm pretty sure when you had cancer, dating was not like the top of the priority list, right? No. <laughs> The woman that I got my first kiss from was a friend who I had known for a year or so. Yeah, I didn't meet her at the time that I was dealing with it. She kind of came more into my life as events unfolded. I hear you that this first experience with a kiss maybe wasn't ideal. Like you felt like she was coming from a place of doing it because she felt bad. Whether that's true or not, we'll never fully know. But that was at least your perception. What do you think has held you back from like making the moves on other people over the years. I am more of a shy, introverted person to start. So it's not really in my character to go out and talk to a random stranger on the street. I mean, I'm doing better with it. Recently, I've kind of given myself some challenges, New Year's resolutions, kind of. And one of them is just to talk to strangers. And I try and I have a little checklist. So I like checking those boxes. And I've just kind of worked up to like asking someone if they are interested in getting like a coffee or if they know of a coffee shop. So just kind of taking baby steps to put myself out there a little bit more. But y'all, ladies, you're intimidating. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, people would say that about any stranger because we live in a world where we don't approach strangers anymore. Anybody is very intimidating. But it's great to have these goals and to take baby steps, but it's the changing your perspective. And this is a perspective I had to learn when I was dating is, yes, you are one personality. I tend to be more introverted, but could I open myself up to be more extroverted today? Would I be able to say hi to that person walking my direction? 
constantly ask yourself, are you open to expanding who you are? Mm -hmm. You don't have to become a full-blown extrovert, but taking these steps to just expand your identity. And then eventually one day you're going to look back and be like, oh, (laughs) I was an introvert and now I'm not. Right. Right? Or I was a full-on introvert and now I'm like maybe a medium introvert. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like fixed versus growth mindset, right? Like, am I who I am today, who I'm always going to be, versus am I an evolving person that may have multiple sides? There may be some people that you feel more introverted with forever, and there might be other people that can bring out that extroverted side. I think the labels might be getting in your way, too, of defining so much. I'm realizing that as we go through this (laughs) podcast. I put a lot of labels on myself that I don't necessarily need to. (laughs) Mm -hmm. No. And I've never even thought about it. You're just Ben, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Or change your name. Whatever. <laughs> <I'll be laughs> you're open to being something, <laughs> being Michael. I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. it's hard for anyone to approach random people on the street and ask them to go to coffee. I commend you that you're trying, but let's just be honest. Yeah. It's going to be hard. Mm-hmm. Dating apps don't have to be the only way. I feel like you would probably thrive in some like activity group where people get to know you over time. But because dating apps are such the norm, we don't want to dismiss this completely. Let's say you are on a date with someone. You said you do get on first dates. Would you ever feel compelled to like make the move? Like Take us through what goes down on your dates? Yeah, good question. My go-to is mini golf, mini golf or bowling. So we will play a game and usually the conversation goes really well. And I think that the date is going really well. Actually, I wouldn't say that I've ever had a bad date, to be honest, in terms of conversation and all that. We'll talk a lot and kind of get to that point at the end of the date. And I definitely get the butterflies and start getting nervous and get in my head a little bit about, okay, I want to make sure that she knows that I like her, but I don't want to be creepy. So I want to like toe that line line. And sometimes, yeah, I'll try and make that first move. I remember one time I even asked a girl if she was okay with me kissing her and she said, uh, no. (laughs) So that didn't work out, but I learned a lot. And recently one of my friends told me to make sure that she knows that you are attracted to her. So I think at first I didn't do a good job of that maybe being more friendly instead of romantic. I haven't gone on a date in a while because I've actually taken a break from the dating apps. But when I do go on another date, I want to emphasize during the date, at the end of the date, that I think the woman's really cute. I want to get to know her more. I think in the past, maybe I overlooked that or maybe even thought too much and froze myself. (laughs) I think your problem is mini golf or bowling. Yes. Like that's your problem right there. Yes. Ding, ding. (laughs) Both of those are activities, Mm -hmm. which of course you're not going to have a bad date because you're playing mini golf or bowling, but you're also not going to have a great date, especially when you don't know someone well enough. Mm -hmm. You can't build rapport when like you're having conversation, but you're not like you're focused more on the activity. So the conversation can't go more than surface level because that's just too many balls to juggle at once. Right. (laughs) So I could just, yeah, (laughs) literally. No pun intended. No pun intended. (laughs) But I could totally see like playing mini golf with someone, having a surface level convo. It's all fine and good. And then you don't feel compelled to make it romantic. And if someone was to make that move, I feel like I would be taken off guard, even if I like like the person because that rapport has not been built over the date. This is a great second or third date. But how do you have a date that you can like build the rapport and also just show someone who you are a bit more than just the activity that you're doing? I guess I have a hard time thinking of something that's not an activity because I don't drink. We could go to a restaurant or something. But at first I did that a lot and would always pay. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of got tired of paying for so many first dates with no benefit. Let's hold that thought for a quick message. As you know, I recently left my corporate job and I've been in total recovery mode all about self-care. One of my new routines is the nighttime shower before bed. There's just something about washing away the day and that reflection that's been super helpful for me. I've been using one of our partners, Osea's Mega Moisture Duo. This combo body oil and body lotion are so freaking incredible. It literally feels like I'm at a spa. I realize that the secret is seaweed and other skin level ingredients 
ingredients that are normally reserved for face products. And that's why I was so excited when Osea became one of our partners. And, you know, we're so grateful for partners like this because one, they keep the show going, but they're also super good for all of our listeners and for our own well-being. So if you want to have that nighttime bliss like I am doing, you can get 10% off your first order site-wide with code DATABLE at oseamalibu.com. You'll get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over $60. So head to oseamalibu.com and use the code DATABLE for 10% off. Let us know which products you end up going with. Share them in social. Super excited to see what you end up choosing. Let's keep talking about this first date thing, because I think you're putting a lot of pressure on the first date. And I used to dread when someone asked me out on a mini golf date. I don't know about you, Julie. I used to dread it. Especially someone I didn't know. Yes. As a first yeah. date, because I was like, I would think, well, it's a lot of effort. <laughs> it's just that we have to and you're stand stuck. the whole time. You're stuck. The conversation doesn't get as intimate. So many freaking distractions around you. Balls everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> like Julie said, her favorite thing, balls everywhere. <laughs> But if we remove the activity out of it, and I think the second thing that you're very much focused on is how to get a good grade on this date. I don't know if that's the best way to put it, but you're like, oh, I need to tell her that I think she's pretty. I need to let her know I'm into her. You're telling us all of this about a future date that I don't know if you would think she's cute. I don't know if you would actually like her, right? The date is a two-way street. It's a time for you to also understand that person and want to see them again. Not everybody you go on a date with, you have to get a good passing score so that they'll see you again. It's not about them. It's about you. So a good environment for something like that, like you were asking, if you don't drink, I think bars are still fine. Bars are great for you can have a virgin drink, you can have some water, you can have a tea. I've definitely had some of these like non-alcoholic drinking dates at bars. I've also done the park date. Mm -hmm. Park dates are always kind of cute. You can be like, I'll bring us some hot chocolate. Dessert bar. And we can just sit there. Oh, okay. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Like I think the ante up. Yeah. I think what's nice about a bar And I totally hear that I don't drink. So you have to decide, like, are you comfortable doing that? Because everyone has different comfort levels. But what's nice about a bar, drinking aside, is the environment. You're sitting side by side. It's dimly lit. It's more conducive to romance, right? Than, like, being out in broad daylight at the mini golf place. Like, it's just, (laughs) or bowling, right? Like, it's just, there's something about the environment that does play in. So how can you find other environments like that that could bring that. I think Mm -hmm. talking side by side, there are studies that it actually makes people open up better than sitting face to face. And I would imagine like talking on the move would be even harder, right? Like, that's just too much to focus on at once. Mm -hmm. So I think I agree with you. eh? It's like the first date, it's simply a meet and greet. It doesn't need to be this big thing. And by making it less of a thing, you can also just see, do I like this person enough that I want to see them again? And then you can keep progressing and it will give you the confidence too a bit more instead of going from this like bigger activity to nothing. No, those are great points. And it makes me want to go on another first date so I can fix this. There you go. (laughs) Right? I think that's the thing with dating burnout. Why do people get burnout from dates is that They're too involved. Too many things happening. You have to put in so much effort. If it's low enough effort, you still have to put in some effort. But if it's fun enough for you, then you will look forward to going on these dates. And then you won't think, oh, I'm just going on date after date because they would be something that you like. It would be fun. And also another suggestion, we've always said this on our show, think about doing like a phone date or a video date. People are hesitant to do that now that we're out of the pandemic. But the thing is, for someone like you, Ben, you have so many layers to you and you have so many stories behind you. It's so hard to build that rapport on a first date if you don't have that background about each other. You sit and it's like immediately you have to evaluate if you're attracted to each other or not. But over the phone or over video, you can start building that back end rapport. So when you see each other, it feels more familiar. Yeah, I've actually never tried a phone or a video date. I think it was great because I did it over the pandemic and I agree with you, UA. We keep hearing that people just don't do this anymore. But it Nobody's was doing it anymore. such a great tool because you went excited to meet someone opposed to just 
oh, here's another date. I'm probably never going to see this person again. You had something to look forward to a little more. I also could see like, even if you love mini golf and bowling, if that's all you're doing on dates, like that's going to get really repetitive in itself for you, not even for the person. Yeah. Of course, like it's going to be burned out, right? Yeah. <laughs> not trying to be a pro mini golfer. So exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Unless if you are, then <laughs> kudos to you. <laughs> but since you're not, maybe um, you don't have to do that every time. Yeah. How do you end your dates? What usually goes down? Usually walk them back to their car, mode of transportation, exchange a few pleasantries and I don't think I've ever kissed a girl on a first date. Maybe a kiss on the cheek or a hug, and that's kind of how it ends. I like to see you again is usually what I'd say, and if it went well, if it went really well, I'd like to see you again, and I would like to learn more about you, stuff like that. I mean, for you, I think having like indicators of interest that are more subtle to build up to it could be a really good thing, too. Mm -hmm. Like now that we're, you know, quote unquote, out of the pandemic, I never want to say that fully, but that's what everyone's mentality is. People are down to get touched again, right? So like, if you are sitting side by side, it makes like a light knee slap or like some subtle touch on the arm or nothing too aggressive, of course, but (laughs) something to just feel out the other person. Like, are they into this? Like if they cringe, move backwards, then you know that like you're not going to make a move and try to kiss this person. But if they're good with it or they start doing it to you too, then it's like, okay, game on. Like, I think for you, like having this more subtle approach could be good too to build your confidence. For some reason, I feel like my romantic skills just were not great from the start. So I'm learning on the fly. Yeah, I've kind of always struggled making that first move or the next step from being a friend or being friendly to being more romantic. But that's getting caught in the past again of like what you were. Yeah. Like, how do we just keep Mm -hmm. moving forward? I feel like that keeps coming back of like, I didn't do this back then or I wasn't that way. It's like, okay, that was your past. That's going to help you in certain ways. But like, let's not like keep that as the only narrative either. Yeah. It's such a limiting belief, but you have to ground yourself in this perspective. Do you think like a five-year-old toddler is going around being like, I'm the most romantic person on earth? We all had to learn how to step out of our comfort zone and to make those moves. Nobody's born with these skills. It's almost like you just have to challenge yourself to do it. And once you do it, it's not that scary on the other side. I think it's more fear based than anything else. Yeah. And you have to do what's comfortable for you. Like I remember my first date with my partner now, he didn't tell me like in person, like, oh, you look really beautiful. Like for him, that was too much. He sent me a text after and I was like, oh, Mm -hmm. I like that. You know, like as like that, you're like, oh, this person's interested in you. So like you can with technology, that could be the good use of technology. If it is too much for you to do something, like you can always do it in a different way. Like how do you start to just keep taking baby steps and look at it almost like this date with a scientist mentality of I'm going to try things out. And if it feels good i'll keep going push myself more if it doesn't then maybe that won't be in my toolbox i've definitely tried some stuff in the past that hasn't worked out like asking the woman if she was wanting a kiss and that didn't work but yeah i'll definitely take that to mind next time i'd say though it's not it didn't work out because it didn't get you the result you wanted that's the shift Mm -hmm. like did it not work out because it didn't feel authentic and good to you or did it not work out by your definition because she didn't return the sentiment Yeah, I think maybe a little bit of both. It kind of felt like maybe I was giving myself an easy way out by not really demonstrating my confidence as much. I think a more confident person wouldn't have asked that question and I don't know. I feel like a confident person could ask that. It's just how you say it. It's not always what you say, but how you say it too. I probably didn't say it in the best tone. Or stop second guessing yourself. Maybe it was just not the right fit, right? And maybe it wasn't the right person to kiss you. And that's okay. Not everybody we request Mm -hmm. a kiss from is going to return that. That's okay. That's good because we won't be going around (laughs) kissing everybody. But (laughs) You would have dry lips. (laughs) (laughs) I would love to hear about the last time you were really into someone who was this person yeah what drew you to them what happened well it was on a bowling date of course (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> it was right around the turn of the year, 2022 to 2023. And we met up for the first time at a bowling alley. We had been texting a fair amount before that. That went really well. We even played games after. We played ping pong and arcade games. And the date kind of lasted like well on into the night. Went back to the parking lot and had a great conversation. Gave her a kiss on the cheek and everything seemed to go really well. I was really attracted to her. We texted a fair amount after the date, like the first few days after. And then she hit me with a text that said something like, I'm not looking for a romantic connection right now. And I was so surprised by that because I just thought that everything was kind of trending in the right direction. Everything seemingly was going so well from my perspective. And that was kind of a hard pill to swallow. So actually that date is kind of what made me think about seeing a therapist Mm. because I was talking to one of my friends I was a little bit depressed from that date and then not really having any results in the past, just kind of getting in my own head about maybe something is wrong with me here. So that kind of spurred me to go seek out help from therapy, which I'm thankful that I did. It's never easy to take on rejection. It's never an easy thing. But also know, I think what's exciting about that story is that you were able to open yourself up and really like someone and communicate that. It just means imagine the next person you meet that you feel that way towards can return those feelings, how amazing that would be. It's like everything we do is a stepping stone for the right person who is just right around the corner for you, really. But we can't let these moments hold us back. It's like, how can we use these moments as stepping stones to getting us back on track? Yeah. So I'm glad that you're in therapy. Sometimes you have to be like, okay, why did that happen to me? Well, it happened to me because it helped me get into therapy. Great. That's a great step, right? That's yeah. such a great learning. I think the next step is you're stilted right now. You're like, ooh, action, inaction, action, inaction. Mm -hmm. I feel a little motivation after this conversation. (laughs) But what else is holding you back from just leaping back into dating again? To be honest, nothing really. Just kind of the, the fact that I've deleted the dating apps, not permanently, but just as a little break. Yeah, I'm definitely open to it. I mean, I think with the story you told, right, like you never know where anyone is in their dating journey. We have no idea what was going on for this person. It might have zero to do with you. We really have no idea. People are using dating apps for all sorts of things. She might have been seeing another person in the mix. Maybe she just got out of a breakup and is burned. We have no idea. So it almost doesn't matter. The only person we can control is ourselves. I think that if you need to take a break from dating, like that's healthy, that's good good to reset. But I also don't want you to just like delete apps because like there's been a bad egg or like someone that like didn't have the same sentiment that you did or things didn't go the exact way that you did. I feel like you're the type of person that does good with like milestones, but What's getting in your way is that you're not meeting the milestones you want to of getting that next date or having a relationship or having the sexual partner, whatever it is. Like, how do you start to like rewrite your narrative and look at like other milestones you can have? Like you was saying, like you express that you like someone like that's a good step. What are some other steps that you can do that are like totally in your control that you can kind of hold on to as success? The first one that comes to mind is asking someone out in person, Mm. displaying that confidence and curiosity about someone who I would like to get to know more. That is what I'm ultimately working towards and kind of why I deleted the apps because I want to push myself to be that person who is confident enough to ask out someone. I think I would be in a lot better spot to start out if you meet someone in person rather than develop a connection through a phone at first and then go play mini golf, (laughs) go bowling. And (laughs) it's just, it's kind of getting off to a bad start, I guess. Okay. So if that's your goal, then the goal really has to be to ask someone out. It cannot be that they say yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We have agreement on that. Okay. Right. (laughs) We can't control what they say. For everything that you see as a flaw or something that's holding you back, 
there's a flip side to it, right? You're an incredibly sensitive person. You're incredibly respectful and thoughtful and innocent. I think innocence is like people want to date mm, someone that so hasn't great. been with a thousand other people, right? Like, that's a positive. Like, how do you start to rewrite this narrative? Because I think what we've gathered from this conversation is you're clinging to the past. You're clinging to a lot of labels and stereotypes. If you were to like say like what you bring to the table right now, this is like a mini therapy session in itself. What would you say? I would say that I'm a great person and that I try and be nice to everyone I meet. I try and have a good perspective on life and not get down in the dumps. I have a good job, a fun job. I kind of have most of the boxes checked that I want to have checked right now. I have some fun hobbies that I work on in my spare time. I feel like I'm an interesting person because of my jobs and hobbies. It's I love tough this. to talk about yourself. It's tough to talk <laughs> it about is myself, tough to talk but... about yourself for sure. <laughs> Any women in Northern California want to sign up for Ben? <laughs> just let out. us know. You can email us. I mean, the thing is, wait, just on paper, you're already a catch. And now we talk to you, you're even more of a catch. You're also forgetting that you're articulate, that you're yeah. working on yourself. You're doing the work. You're going through it. I think these are more important qualities than anything else because that can't be taught. It's not like a job that you can just teach yourself a skill and you can do this job. Doing the work, damn, you really have to be in the right mindset for that. So good for you on that. You always say like, oh, I'm not as confident. What if you say I'm confident, but I could be more confident? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Don't undersell yourself. I'm a confident person, but some days I feel like I could be even more confident. There you go. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to fill in any gaps there. You're just trying to add more to who you already are. Your relationship with yourself, I think, is the most important thing right now because we started this conversation with you being incel, and by the end, we realize you're not. Or at least I don't think you <laughs> I don't think you are either, yes. <laughs> at all. I don't think that's your group. <laughs> that's not your posse. <laughs> and I think that that really shows the disconnect between who you think you are and who you actually are. This podcast has definitely helped me think about things and very different lights. So I'm very thankful for that. Good. Through this process, I've definitely learned so much about myself and worked a lot on myself. So it's kind of like the cancer story. I'm ultimately thankful for being able to kind of go through this hardship and being able to yeah. learn from it. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like I've done a good job of not getting too down, finding the help mm -hmm. when I need it through friends or a therapist. These days, I'm really starting to feel like I'm getting comfortable in my own skin. That's the most important thing. Yes. I mean, I think this has been such a great conversation. It's really fun to go through the thought processes. <laughs> Maybe at least fun for you and I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tough, but yeah, it's fun. <laughs> You're like, I don't know if I describe this as fun, but <laughs> insightful. We didn't even record but this episode. We're just <laughs> <laughs> it's just for you and I's own enjoyment. That's it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but I think a lot of people have these inner monologues. I know I've been there before, and we always focus on what we don't do enough and what we don't have. And like, how do we flip the script to what we do? do have, what we bring to the table. And like you just said, like we can acknowledge that there's stuff we want to do better, but that doesn't mean that we're not sufficient at all in that capacity. Yeah. So, so much of dating is the mentality that you bring, how you show up on dates. And I think that's mentally how you show up and also physically and not physically how you look, but the environment, the vibe that's being put out there. We've established maybe there's other ways that you can build connection through environment alone a little more. My other like major takeaway is so often, I've been guilty of this too, is we get stuck of a vision of ourselves in the past. We attach labels that don't need to be there. And like, how do we let go of who we were at one stage of life and just say, okay, that's not who I am today. I'm evolving. Who I am today isn't who I'm going to be tomorrow. And that's a beautiful thing. And it doesn't need to prevent me from what I want because I haven't been able to get it in the past. I'm definitely my own worst critic. Mm -hmm. We all are. Sometimes that can help in like really self-evaluating and figuring out what needs to be done. But most often, it really gets me into my own thoughts in my own head. And I tend to overthink things. This conversation has really helped me yeah. kind of realize where I'm overthinking. Also, where I'm a little bit underthinking, like yeah. mini golf and bowling. 
<laughs> I need to <laughs> I need to kind of get out of the box a little bit. Like underthinking yeah. what you bring to the table too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Ben's gonna go on his next date and the girls can be like, Can we do mini golf? <laughs> He's yeah, gonna of email us gonna and be like, like damn you too. Yeah. <laughs> Someone really wants to do mini, mini golf with me. Uh, <laughs> So you also have this kindness to you that I hope that people see and can feel. This is why I'm like, get on the phone, because just having a five minute conversation with you, I think it's very apparent how kind and compassionate you are. But there is this a weighted down feeling about you. And I think it's your weighted down by your identity, Mm -hmm. by your labels, by what you think Mm -hmm. you should be, by what you think dating should be like and how you're not partaking in what dating should be. Again, you're carving your own path. And you are not currently bringing that main character energy. No. You're letting someone else write your screenplay. You're (laughs) letting other people play you in your movie. And whoever you're going on a date with, that is the main person in your movie. What if you switched, flipped the script, pun intended, (laughs) and you become the main character? Try it for one day, Ben. Just leave your house, be like, this blockbuster film starring Ben. <laughs> you just leave your house like, whoa, things are just going to happen, right? Or you let things happen. I feel like just by calling yourself an incel, involuntary celibate, yeah, that's saying I'm not the main character. Someone else is controlling my life. Don't relinquish that control, right? You only have one life to live. And you felt that when you went through cancer. I'm sure that made you look at life in such a different way, how precious it is. So if you only have this one life to live, you're the main character, you bring that on and you go on these first dates. It's not about getting someone else to like you back. It's about you feeding your main character. What's going to propel this story forward? Is it a good story for me? Is it good for me? Right. Mm -hmm. I think that will really help you get away from the labels and being weighted down by putting yourself in a box. And who I was in the past. Yeah, definitely. Those are some great points. I go see that movie. (laughs) Sounds like a stellar movie. (laughs) Just for the record, too. too, It's not that you could never go on mini golf dates again. We welcome welcome (sighs) you going on like a third or fourth date on mini golf. It's just how do you set yourself up for success to form a connection earlier on? Yeah. That's kind of the takeaway there. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We're not saying don't ever do these things. There are no rules in this. It's like, how can you establish that connection? Maybe you go to a park date before mini golf. You know, there's like a setup beforehand so you can establish that rapport. If you really must go to mini golf, (laughs) that's what you can do. But thank you for this conversation. I also think this is so great for a lot of hetero women to listen to because- a lot of hetero women think men have it so easy. They're probably yes. like just furiously swiping while yes. they're on the shitter. Like, rah, 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 yes, yes, yes. And they're going on all these dates that they want. And here comes Ben, who is so thoughtful and intentional about dating, saying, hey, I would really like to go on some quality dates. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you're giving a lot of people hope in this story, in telling your story. Thank you for that. Yeah, You're such a catch. I feel like it's great to go in the real world, but also I don't want you to like cut off other avenues too. Like, how do you just keep yourself open for whatever way it's going to show up? Mm-hmm. Just knowing that you're someone that someone's lucky to be with. I won't ever quit the dating apps personally, because I don't want to limit myself. But definitely my goal right now is to be more comfy in person. Yeah, that's like my short term goal. And then long term goal is to open myself to all those avenues again. I think that's good, especially for you that maybe struggles with that even on dates from dating apps. So like making sure that you are comfortable in person is important, whatever avenue you end up meeting that person. We feel super comfy with you, so that's good. (laughs) We're friends now. Nice. And thanks again for sharing your story and your perspective. We want to thank our listeners for listening in. What did you learn from Ben, all of you listening at home? What did you learn? I'm sure this is such a relatable situation for so many of our frustrated daters. Let us know what you learned. You can tag us on Instagram. You can email us, hello at Dateable Podcast, or you can leave us a rating and review and then tell us what you (laughs) learned there. Give us five stars and say, Ben taught me this, or I realized this about (laughs) myself there. It's a great forum to share your learnings and giving us five stars in the meantime. (laughs) All right, we're going to wrap up this episode. Stay Stay dateable. 
The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Media Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at Dateable Podcast and visit datablepodcast.com for access to all the episodes in our premium programs. Also, make sure to subscribe today if you haven't already on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform so you are the first to get all the latest episodes. And most importantly, stay dateable. Thank you.